Okay. Welcome everybody to our advanced recording workshop uh, where we'll talk about um, more professional ways to record um, music and um, maybe get to know more professional workflows and professional equipment um, to help you understand how a professional recording is made and maybe um, conduct one of your own. We're always the same people. Today, uh, Sasha and I will do the workshop and Dima is here to help us translate. Um, as always, we encourage you to turn on your camera. If you've got any questions, raise your hand using the Zoom function or write in the chat. We've got uh, the uh, Ukrainian slides ready in the folder, in the Google Drive folder, if you want to follow in long, along in Ukrainian. And also, uh, you can, you can activate the live transcription to help you understand us better. All right. Before we get into the topic, uh, as always, we got a little question. Um, this is what more open question. So if you recorded yourself using the knowledge of the recording basics workshop, raise your hand. Did some of you already put this the theory into practice? Yeah. Okay, great. At least one person. Um, yeah, we know you don't have the the microphones yet, but um, yeah, it, great that you could already do a recording. Uh, the rest of you didn't manage to do that. Um, if you want, you the the one who who did also already record uh, himself. If you got maybe want to share your experience, maybe you've got some did have some problems um and you can explain how you dealt with them or uh, you've got some tips for your fellow students uh, to to uh, um so they don't make the same mistake as you did maybe or something that worked very well Do you uh, i'm sorry i'm yeah. in quite um, um noisy environment right now yeah so uh, i'm on tour actually Ah, okay. Yeah, wow. In Düsseldorf. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. but uh, I I had experience before. I mean, not not uh, after workshop, but yeah, I already did some recordings. Uh, yeah. So. Okay. All right. Yeah. Then uh, let's hope let's hope that the rest of you will gain some experience in the next few weeks. And to help you um, do the best recording possible, we'll give you some more uh, knowledge um, yeah, to help you with this. We organized this uh, knowledge that we want to share with you into four levels. The first level um, you already heard in our first workshop. Uh, it's when you're recording audio and video together, maybe using a smartphone with the Zoom microphone or without. Um, and the next level would be to separate video and audio. This, uh, this means that you can maybe use some devices that are especially made for recording audio and video. And uh, it's, it's got some more advantages to uh, uh, separate these uh, two things. Next level would be to use uh, this, also separate audio and video, but use more professional microphones. And he will talk more about the technical side and um, how microphones work and uh, stuff like this. And in level four, we'll, four, we'll give you some examples uh, of some professional multi microphone setups. Um, and how they work. With every level builds on top of each other, so everything you learn for each level uh, helps you understand the next level. Each level gives you a little bit more 
difficulty in conducting the recording, but it can help you achieve better results. To start with uh, level two, uh, I'll give it to Sascha. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Jasper. And exactly, so um, with level two, we will use what we learned in level one to record audio and video with our smartphone in our basic recording workshop, but try to improve it. And the next step for improving it would be to actually separate the audio and video. Now, why is this important or why does it improve our recording? Well, there's two factors, of course. One is how does the picture look? And the second one is how does the recording sound? And these two, they might be in conflict with each other. In the basic recording workshop, we learned how to find a good spot for the microphone, to have a good sound, how to position ourselves in the room. But of course, um, this sometimes can lead to problems with the picture because for the picture, we want to have a nice light, we want to have a nice angle and a nice framing. And maybe we don't want to have some obstacles or objects like um, music stands, for example. But for to have a good audio, we of course um, need to position an instrument. Sometimes we just need a space. Um, we of course uh, are needing to deal with uh, room acoustics. As we said, we need to find a good um, position in the room, uh, how this room sounds in different positions, how the instrument is actually playing. For example, the, the piano sounds in a different direction than the player is looking. And of course, also what sound character do we want to have? And to and these two things, they can be in conflict with, with each other, meaning that the spot for the good picture and the spot for the good sound are actually different, or for the best picture and the best sound. And to emphasize this point, I want to show you an example of mine that a recording I did over a year ago. On the left, you can see uh, a picture from the camera perspective. So here I have a pianist, he's playing solo, and there's a camera pointing in a way that I can see his fingers and of course his face too. But if you look at the right picture, you can actually see that the microphones, uh, the, they're much higher and they're much further to the right the microphone they follow the sound of the piano so surely two or three meters away there were the microphones positioned because at this position where the picture was the sound of the piano would have not been as great as it was in the position that i put the microphones later so here you can already see a good example of even if i would use not this professional microphones but like the the zoom my uh, uh, iq7 or am7 for the for the smartphone um, even then, if I would have a phone recording the video and I would have a phone recording the audio on a better position, I would have a much better sound and a uh, much nicer picture. Because in this way, I do not have to make some compromises. So if we're talking about maybe shortly the recording technology, let's talk also about what we can use to improve. And let's start with the cameras. So as always, first is most important thing, where you put the camera and which light you're using and how, how you're using the light is much more important than the technology. These smartphones, they are very, very good. They have a really impressive uh, picture quality. Um, they have some disadvantages. For example, this, my phone only has like two cameras. So I can only choose like a wide angle and a close angle. And of course, it's not so easy to position them to have a good picture. So if you would like to update, maybe um, the next step for you would be like a DSLR or a camcorder. Um, they are made for photography and videography and they have a greater dynamic range. You can use nicer optics with it. They have a bigger sensor, so they are not as noisy. They are dealing better in dark environment and in light environment. But of course they're getting more and more complex and more expensive. And the last thing we've shown you are the professional video cameras, which are used in like professional TV studios and, and broadcast studios. Of course, they're very professional and they have a great pictures, but they're also very, very expensive. Similarly, with the audio, it's again, most important that you have a good room and a good placement of the microphones. 
And this is also more important than the technology. And you will maybe hear a little later even with an example that Jasper is giving. But here we feel that improving the technology is actually more helpful than with the video because already with these small microphones, this small IQ7 or, IA, or AM7 microphones for a smartphone, you can improve the sound quality a lot and they're very easy to use. You can use them just with your smartphone. And uh, in this way, you can record audio and video together as you know, but you can also record audio separately, um, which we are trying to do here. The next category would be portable recorders. Um, they're actually similarly priced, so and they have a similar audio quality, um, but they are just um, maybe a little more practical because you just have one device uh, for that and you can use your phone for the video. You can also connect it to the notebook or PC uh, or the tablet like I do for Zoom uh, meetings as we have heard last time in our online conference workshop. And of course they can only record audio. Um, the next step, and this is then something that we will talk about, uh, Jasper will talk about in level three is the professional microphone and interface setup. Of course, it's the most expensive, but it's also the most flexible. Um, so how to use that, if you want to use it, we will talk about in level three. We will focus on this level again, on uh, the microphones for mobile phones or the portable recorders, because the next step from recording audio and video together with a smartphone is to record it separately, but still use the same microphones. So how can we also improve our recordings? Well, we need to find a very good spot for the audio for the microphones to have a good audio. And for that, we already learned a lot about the room acoustics in the first workshop, but now I want to talk with you about the acoustics of the instruments, which also play a big role because instruments are actually quite complex when it comes to acoustics. It's actually the fact that not all the sound leaves the instrument in all directions um, in the same amount. And you can see it on this picture um, that is on the slide below. So on the top left, you have this circle. And there you see that the very low frequencies of the violin. So this is a violin, uh, by the way. <laughs> it's, it's written there. The very low frequencies are actually radiated in the all, all the same in all directions. Yeah. So the very low strings, the G string, for example, and the very low notes, they are radiated all the same in all directions. But if you are going to the very high frequencies and they're on the bottom right on the picture, you can see that these are actually going only in one direction and this is like almost only to the top, yeah? So the very high notes, the flageolets uh, or harmonics of the violin, um, they go all the way only to the top. And in this way, of course, where you position the microphone, will also change how the violin will sound because some frequencies, they are more prominent from the one angle than uh, from other angles. And this means that actually with the placement of the microphone, you have a big impact on the sound of the violin or other instruments. Now, this is very, very complex uh, field of acoustics and uh, it would be too much to go into a lot of detail but I want to give you some rules of thumb for sound radiation and what we can then learn from the microphone placement. And I have um, put the different instruments in different categories and maybe Jasper can switch the next slide. Thank you. <laughs> and um, yes, let's start with the brass instruments. So the brass instruments are actually very easy because um, they are made of metal, they're a cylinder, and then they have this bell on the front. And this bell is, um, so all the sound of the, of the brass instruments goes out only in one direction. Yeah, so it's a very directional sound. And um, this means that it's very easy to put the microphone. So just follow the bell, follow the direction of the instrument, and then just put it a little to the left or a little to the right or a little to the top or below, yeah? So not directly into the beam of sound, but a little to the side. And um, there you will probably have already a quite good sound if you are recording brass instruments like trumpet, horn, 
trombone, etc. With string instruments, we already also talked about them a little just a second ago. And um, you already seen that um, the higher the frequencies, the higher the strings, the more perpendicular they will sound. So um, the sound will go on the right angle from the corpus. So on the violin, if I hold it like that, the sound will go to the top if it's a very high frequency. And the sound on the cello and the double bass will go to the front for the high frequencies. For the very low frequencies and the low notes, it will be more like a sphere, yeah? And in between, it will be very chaotic. But this also means that, for example, on the violin, you can tune the sound of, an, of the violin with a microphone. If you put it very high from the top, I hope you can see it, <laughs> then it will be very bright, so very detailed, very bright sound, and yeah? But maybe not so warm. But if you, for example, put it a little lower and from there, then you will not have so many high frequencies. It will sound maybe warmer, but maybe also not so clear and you cannot really understand a lot, yeah? So you can choose actually with the strings very easily the, the sound of the instrument by just, for example, going from top or from the side. With the woodwinds, it's a very messy and chaotic and especially the bassoon because these are just, they have these finger holes and sound just goes everywhere and it's very, very complex. But um, one rule is to not put the microphone close to the bell. So on the oboe and the clarinet, not on the bottom of the instrument, on the bassoon, not from the top, um, because there it will surely not sound good. But um, maybe a good approach is to actually just go from the front, so where the audience sits, and just try to go from the audience perspective. Um, the piano is also very complex and it's actually quite an art for sound engineers to record piano. But there's also one good rule of thumb is when you have the piano here and you have this lid and then the lid is open, you can just follow the angle of the lid and then position your microphones along this line. This will give you a good starting point with the piano. Of course, with percussion, it's also very dependent on the instrument. There are a lot of different instruments. Um, it's not, there's no easy rule for that, but again, here, maybe it's good to put uh, the audience perspective. Um, the microphones in the audience perspective, that's always a good um, spot to start. And if you have singers, um, they're similar to the brass, they're actually very directional. So the beam of sound has a very strong direction, especially in front of the mouth. So also there, it's good to put it in front of the singer, but a little from above. So in this way, um, you will have the good starting point for the sound of the, of the singer. And again, recapturing also what we learned in the workshop one of how to record yourself. The goal is here to record the ideal sound of the instrument in the room. So play with the distance, try to find a good spot where the direct sound of the instrument or the voice and the room sound are in a good balance. You can also, for example, go higher, as I said, with the piano, yeah, you, you need to maybe go higher then further. And as always, try to experiment a lot to find the sounds for your instruments, because in the end, you know how, a, if you're a violinist, you know how a violin should sound. And I think you're the experts on that. So experiment a lot and really try to find the good sound that you're looking for. Okay, similarly to the good positioning of the microphones, of course, now we have a camera, which is also free to move. And we can also try to make it a very good positioning for that. We also, again, talked a little about it in the workshop one, but here I just want to give you some more examples of um, how we can position cameras in different situations. So the first example is the piano recording that I was showing to you before. Again, here I wanted to see the fingers of the pianist, I wanted to see the face, but I also wanted to see the whole instrument. I have actually put lights, which you might have seen on the other pictures. In that way, the instrumentalist is very bright and the back of the concert hall is rather dark. So he really pops out and you have the focus of the audience directly on the instrumentalist. Yeah, so you can use the light really to really put the focus on the instrument and the instrumentalist. Similarly with the light, the next example here, 
I also used the light, but I used it a little differently. You can see the light comes more from the sides and it creates like a, like a big atmosphere for this piece, yeah? So it's not really frontal, it's not very clear, but it, it, this is a very, you know, um, a piece which has a big atmospheric like feel to it. So I wanted to also make the light a little more atmospheric and create a little more atmosphere for this piece. And also, for example, I used uh, DSLR for this. So I had an optic where the background is a little more blurred. And this way also the cellist, he will be really on the front and in the focus. If you record with ensembles or you want to record an ensemble, and it's always good to try to find a camera position which in which everyone is seen. Yeah, so here you can see the eight cellists and you can really see the face of everyone. That's, that's quite uh, important. Um, also, it's always nice because this is a church and you will hear in the recording that it's a church. It's always very nice to also see that it's a church. Yeah, so when you have a very... Um, characteristic acoustic or just the acoustic of the room it's always good to also show a little of the room because in this way the things that we hear like we hear it's a long reverb and a long church and the things that we see okay it's really a church they match and in this way um, the everything fits together very well yeah if it would be very close and you wouldn't see where it is maybe it would lead to some confusion especially when you have a long reverb and you cannot see where the ensemble is playing. So it's always good to also show the room in which the musicians are playing to match the acoustic impression. And similarly, two more examples, um, very short. Um, here, I needed to be a little more creative. I wanted to show everyone, including the conductor. So I actually just went from very high and it's actually a quite nice perspective in the end. Um, so yeah, so yeah be also ready to experiment with these perspectives and also lastly um, with this ensemble they were actually positioning themselves on very uh, unusual positions and i of course instead of going from the front now i try to go a little from the side so i can see everyone and also on the musicians on the back i put a little more light because they are already further back and thus i wanted to have them the same attention than the musicians on the front. So I tried to make a little more light on the back. In the end, there's a lot of good videos on YouTube. You can see um, everyone watches YouTube performances of us. So you can get inspired there by some perspectives. And I think with the video perspectives, it's very easy to just see what you want to um, achieve and then try to achieve it yourself. So just go to YouTube, go to your favorite recordings see what they're doing and try to do the same for your recordings. Okay, so from now on, we will focus more on audio technology and uh, not talk about video so much anymore, but um, we will talk more about video positions, angles and settings for video in our workshop number five, which is I think in two or three weeks. Yes. So we, Separated audio and video, we have one camera, we have a nice position for the camera, we have the microphone, and we have a nice position for the microphone too. Now we need to decide, because we are only dealing with um, audio, which settings we should use in our microphones. And if we are using a recording audio only, and we're using the portable recorder or the, the smartphone, we have different options here to choose. And I want to explain them to you a little and go through them one by one. So we have to choose three things. It's the sample rate, the bit depth, and the file format that we want to record. This will be now a little technical, but I will try to make it as brief as possible and as short. So first we have to set the sampling rate. What is the sampling rate? Well, in order for the computer to deal with the audio signal, it needs to measure it actually in regular intervals. So we have very um, discrete um, moments in time and we are measuring them the sound wave. So how, how high the wave is, how low the wave is, etc. And we do that very regularly. And the sampling rate or the sampling frequency, it, it means the same, it just describes how often per second this happens. How often per second do we measure the sound wave? 
And there's a, a, a proven theory that at least we need at least to measure two times as often as the highest frequency that we want to record. So the humans, we can hear from 20 Hertz to 20 kilohertz. And this means that we need at least a sampling frequency of 40 kilohertz or 40,000 Hertz. And in audio for media, we say that we actually use a little more headroom. So we make it a little more higher um, just to be safe. And this is why 48 kilohertz or 48,000 Hertz is standard as a sampling rate. This means that we measure the wave 48,000 times per second and we measure how high is it actually. Similarly, we have to decide that once we measured the wave, how much information do we store with each measurement or as we call it in audio technology with each sample. And we of course store it in a binary number because the computer is using binary numbers. And so we are using binary digits or bits for short. And you can think about this information that we store per sample um, with an analogy that I, uh, that I use, which is the body height. For example, I am one meter 72. And now I want to write it down how tall am I. So if I would only use one digit, this would mean I would use very little space. But then I would need to decide, am I one meter or am I two meters? OK, two meters is closer. So I would write two meters, but it's quite wrong. There's still 30 centimeters, roughly, that, are, that I would write myself to be too high. OK, so I can try to get more precise, but then I would have to write two numbers. For example, 1.7 meters. It's still not really perfect, but it's much better already. But this also means I need more space. Yeah, I need to write one. 0.7. And of course, I can get more and more precise. I um, can write three digits or numbers. So I would be 172 meters. Or you could even go with more and more detailed. Um, I never measured myself <laughs> more detailed than centimeters. Similarly, when you measure the wave, you can also describe the height of the wave with a bit or a binary digits. And the more you use, of course, the more precise you can describe the height, just the same as with my body height. This means if we use a low bit depth, it means we will use only little numbers. We have a bad quality, of course, we have a lot of noise, but we also have less data. If we use a high bit depth, then we have a cleaner sound because we describe it more precise. And therefore we have a higher quality, but of course we also use more data. So we have to find a good point. And the good point in recording audio is to use 24 bits. So this is a setting that you can use, which is really, really used by professionals all around the world and will give you very good recordings to work with. And the third setting that we have to choose are the file formats. So here we have two categories, either compressed audio or uncompressed audio. The compressed audio, we already got to know last time a little. Uh, the goal is here to make a file size, which is as small as possible. But in order to achieve that, the algorithm which is creating these files, they are removing information from the recording, which they consider inaudible. Um, of course, if we are trying to make this too small, we can actually hear that information is missing. And we were having an example of that. And the last time in the basic, um, in the online conference workshop, <clears throat> sorry. And there's a link, but I will not show it to you again. Um, <clears throat> I have no water. I hope my voice will recover. This format is used inside video formats. Um, so when you make a video, then the audio will have this compressed version. <clears throat> and this is also what we recommend it for, for the final product. So for example, if you create a recording for your professor to hear on Dropbox or um, you know upload it on YouTube, then they use this, um, you can use, or YouTube will use this um, smaller file size <clears throat> because it's easier on the internet. And with the right settings, it's actually quite okay in the quality. But 
<clears throat> there's the other category, which is uncompressed audio. And this is usually the wave format. It's mostly known, or the second mostly known is AIF, AIFF format. And here you get the raw and full audio information uh, that we talked about before with the measurements of the samples and the information that, the, the, how much information do we store with that? Of course, they will be bigger file sizes, but <clears throat> you have the full in audio information and really no quality loss at all. This is best for recording, of course, or if you make an export of your mix for putting it to the video, or if you want, for example, to make a high quality final product like a CD, um, then also you have to use uncompressed audio because there you will have uncompressed full quality audio on a CD, for example. Okay, this was a lot of technical detail, but maybe to sum it up, um, here are short recommendations again in written form. I will not go through them at all, all in depth. We recommend 48 kilohertz. If you're using uncompressed audio, um, you should, uh, for the export, you should also choose 24 bits um, and the WAV format. And um, if you are making an export for only the final audio, for example, for your professor to listen to, then you can also use MP3 or AAC or OTG. They're all basically the same and either choose the high, highest quality, or if there's a number, choose something between 256 and 320. And in this way, you will have a very high quality MP3. Okay. Again, this was very technical, but let's remember, let's go a step back. We are trying to record audio and video separately. And, and now we have find found the spot for our video camera. We have found a good spot for our microphones. We have looked at the settings that we need to set to have the best possible quality recording in our microphones. Now we have to actually conduct the recording. And again, it's basically the same as level one, but there are some changes or some additions to that. And again, it's always important to announce the take before you, uh, when you record. But additionally, it's also very helpful to clap before every take, because with the clap, you can later synchronize the audio and the video. And we will tell you how to do that again in the um, workshop for video editing. But here is already a short excerpt. Um, so the top two lines, you can see there are the video and the bottom line is only the audio recording. And so the middle line, the green one, is the audio that was recorded from the camera. And because I clapped, I can see exactly the spike on the camera microphone and the microphone that I put separately. And I can put them, just align them so they're on the same time. And then I can mute or disable the microphone from the um, camera. And I have a audio of my separate microphone and the video of my camera and they are perfectly synchronized in that way. And for this, we need a clap. So yeah, you can see on the small pictures on the left of this line, I have my hands open. On the right, they're closed. So it's actually synchronized in this point. Two more small um, tips. It's always good to first start the audio recording and then later start the video recording because audio uses less space. And also, of course, if you have the possibility, try to use professional stands for the camera and the microphones to have the greatest flexibility in positioning. Because in level two, again, with these two separate uh, audio and video recordings, we really want to find the best spot for each and we need a good flexibility in positioning. Okay. Before we now go to level three and Jesper will take over, maybe we have a short moment for some questions. Okay, I don't think there are any questions. I hope that's a good sign. Yes, Bob. Okay, let's talk about some professional recording equipment. I've got 
a list of uh, all the things you need uh, to conduct a recording using this technology um, here. And we'll go from left to right uh, to follow the signal flow. So we start with the sound waves from our uh, instrument and they reach our microphones. And a microphone is there to turn these sound waves into electrical signals. We'll go more in, in depth uh, uh, on microphones because of course they are a very important part of the recording process. Um, then this electrical signal needs to get into our computer somehow. And to transport the electrical signal, we use XLR cables. These are cables uh, that have these three pins or on the other end, these three holes. And our microphone has got the same uh, pins so we can connect the two um, just like this. And on the other hand, on the other, other end, we're connected to our audio interface. Um, this device has also these th the same connection, so we can connect it like this. An audio interface is a device that helps getting audio in and out of the computer. So, um, yeah, it, it just is like a translator in, in a way. And uh, one thing that it does is uh, make the signal understandable for the computer. So uh, everything that um, Sasha already talked about with the with the digital signal, uh, with the ones and zeros, is done in this interface. Another thing that is done in in an interface is amplifying the electrical signal. This you already know from from the Zoom microphone where you have this dial uh, to amplify the signal to make it less noisy. Uh, the same is then done here in, in the interface. The interface is connected to a computer using most of the time it's just a USB cable. Um, and on the computer, uh, you can record the signal and manipulate it later using a special program that you'll learn more about in the next uh, workshop. Um, yeah, so this is everything uh, that you need. And we already talked about these portable recorders. Some of these portable recorders also have these uh, connections so that you can uh, connect a professional microphone to it and then use it as an audio interface. So. Basically, a portable recorder can also be an audio interface. And a portable, rec portable recorder uh, has some microphones built in and also ha has the possibility to record onto it um, its SD card. So um, they are very versatile devices. I know some of you uh, own such a device. So yeah, it's, it can be very useful. Uh, the only thing that cannot be done with this, uh, of course, is um, doing really professional post-production. So the mixing or editing uh, there, a computer is still needed. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about microphones. Microphones come in every kind of shape and um, every microphone sounds a little bit different and works a little bit different. We've got two main types that we'll look at. And then there are two very important properties of microphones that differentiate them from each other. Uh, the one is the directionality. And then the second one is the frequency response. And we'll have a look at this as well. Every microphone basically works the same way. We've got a thin membrane, um, a really thin membrane. It's like a tenth of the thickness of aluminum foil. And this membrane moves because of the air pressure changes due to the sound wave. So it um, the air pushes against the uh, membrane, which makes it move. And this movement um, is then turned into electricity. And there are some 
these these different types uh, of microphones that use different physical effects and um, these two types are condenser microphones and dynamic microphones and the one thing that differentiates them is the way that the movement of the membrane is turned into electricity um, condenser microphones are very sensitive um, but are also the most natural sounding um, and yeah this makes them perfect for recording classical or popular music um, they the one thing that that's important to know is that they require phantom power this is just a button that you have to press on your audio interface here it's uh, this 84 uh, 48 volt knopf uh, button that you can press uh, that needs to be turned on otherwise it just wouldn't work and yeah some examples of these microphones would be a uh, um, higher end microphone would be a neumann km184 uh, middle of the road rode nt nt5 or even cheaper the m5 uh, they all work fine and especially uh, there are different types of condenser microphones especially the ones looking like this like these um small um yeah they look like pencils maybe um are really useful for recording classical music um so yeah if you're thinking about getting getting some microphones maybe these are the the choice they look like this on the other hand there are the dynamic microphones uh, that are more mechanically robust um but on the other hand are also less natural sounding you probably know this microphone from stages everywhere which it's, it's a, a microphone mostly used for singers um, um but of course it could be also used for recording popular music um because of the way they are built they sound a little bit less natural um yeah so consider using condenser microphones so there are the two things that um, make um make microphones sound and behave differently um directionality is one of them um this describes how um sensitive the microphone is to sound from different directions so uh, with a cardioid uh, polar pattern um the microphone is not so um sensitive from the back so this means if you've got a sound source from the back it won't be recorded as loudly than it if it was coming from the front uh, this can be used for example if you got multi multiple instruments and you want to separate them or you've got a very the, the room that you're recording in uh, has got a lot of reverb and you're trying to uh, record it with not so much reverb then maybe also use a cardioid microphone on the other hand there are the omnidirectional microphones that have the same sensitivity from every direction uh, which helps them capture the room sound very naturally so if you've got a micro it's a microphone that can be used to record a whole room um, very naturally um, you'll know what kind of microphone you're using because uh, the symbols are always printed on them so the symbol for a cardioid polar pattern uh, would be this um it's on a different spot every on every microphone uh, but it always looks the same and uh, yeah here it looks like this yeah, it's pretty similar and i've also got uh, the the symbol for an omnidirectional microphone is just a um circle so let's hear a little comparison 
of how these uh, different polar patterns sound. Um, let me send it in the chat. There we go. So you can listen for a minute and then we'll talk about it. Okay, I think you might be done. Yes, all right. Um, so you could hear that, yeah, just the, the bass was uh, much quieter in the example where I used the cardioid polar pattern. Um, yeah, just just an example of, of course, you can't eliminate it completely because it's uh, all over in the room uh, reflected from the walls, um, but it just helps it uh, get more quiet. Okay. The next important thing is the frequency response. Uh, this just means that uh, a microphone doesn't always record every frequency uh, with the same level. Um, and you can see it in this example of a Shure SM58. Uh, we've got on the X axis are uh, the frequencies ranging from the lowest frequency we can hear to the highest frequency we can hear. And you notice that um, with this microphone, uh, you cannot record um, frequencies that are uh, pretty low. Uh, so they will be a little bit quieter. On the other hand, yeah, around five to 10 kilohertz. There are some bumps in the frequency response, which um, yeah makes it a little bit more bright. And yeah, to to this this uh, just can color the sound that you record. And you uh, for classical music, it might be um, a good idea to use a microphone with a very flat frequency response, where most frequencies are uh, recorded with the same level. I've got an example for this as well. Um, I tried to find an example of two microphones that sound very different. Um, yeah, let's hear the comparison. I'll give you yeah, half a minute. And then we'll talk about it. Okay, I think uh, you, you could be done. So uh, the comparison is between like this uh, dynamic microphone, both of uh, the Shure SM58 and this uh, small membrane condenser microphone with the Neumann. And 
Uh, you might be able to tell a little difference uh, as the one one of them sounds a little bit brighter maybe and um, the biggest difference might be that you, you if you listen again later that the sure is uh, much noisier than the Neumann um, but you also notice that the difference is not that great um and this is also to encourage you to uh, maybe use cheaper microphones because uh, the difference um uh, between more expensive microphone or cheaper microphones isn't that that big and um yeah you will be able to hear a difference if you really focus in on it uh, in a direct comparison but otherwise um yeah the, the difference is not that great Okay, let's find out how to use these microphones in a way that creates uh, beautiful recordings. Usually, you we, we, we use the concept called the main microphone, where we just use two microphones uh, that can capture the whole sound that we're trying to capture. Um, why two microphones? Well, we want to uh, create a stereo recording because it sounds more natural. We've got one microphone for each ear, basically. Um, this just sounds much nicer than a mono recording where you would just use one microphone. These two microphones are then placed in front of your instrument that you're trying to record or ensemble from uh, uh, chamber music to orchestra. Usually, always you'll find a microphone, two microphones in front of the ensemble. And there are different ways uh, to place these two microphones. And the one way that we recommend you to use is the ORTF, um, because it so just sounds good in most circumstances. Of course, if you are doing this, you need two cables and an interface with two interfaces, with two inputs at least, and something called a stereo bar, uh, which just helps to keep the microphones in place. Uh, you don't need to remember the name ORTF, but what might be useful to remember is that uh, you place the tips of the microphone around 17 centimeters apart, and you angle the two microphones at an angle of 110 degrees and um yeah this is then put in front of the ensemble or the micro or the instrument there are some other uh, micro uh, stereo systems that we can have a quick look um on um, the most common one maybe being the ab system we use it quite often because it creates a very open and enveloping sound that's really nice here you can you have two microphones that are parallel to each other and then you can vary the distance between the um the two microphones maybe start with something like 60 centimeters um and then you can try to go bigger or smaller um to change the sound and there are also the XY system and the MS system, uh, both sounding pretty similar. The good thing about these systems is that you've got a very good localization. This means when you listen back, you'll be able to really point towards the sound source, and this might be a desired effect. Um, they work a little bit differently. Uh, you try to put the two microphones in the same spot and then angle them to create a uh, stereo effect. Here you can only use uh, cardioid microphones. With the AB, you can also use omnidirectional microphones. Um, usually you start with 90 degree and then you can tr try to change the angle for a different result. With the MS, you already know it from our Zoom microphone. Um, we've got one microphone for the mid signal, one for the, for the side signal, and by ch changing the ratio of the mid and side signal, you can change the sound characteristics. I've got one example 
uh, on how it might look uh, using an ORTF for um, recording a violin. And we'll take a look at other main systems and more in the next level. But before we do so, maybe if you've got questions, otherwise we can uh, just put them together after our last level because we're already pretty late. Okay, I think we'll move on and to tell you more about the professional multi-microphone approach, uh, Sasha will speak again. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I hope it's okay for everyone that we take maybe 10 minutes longer than usual, um, but I think this is all, all quite interesting um, stuff for you. So again, we were improving with each level our uh, recordings and using the professional microphones and the main microphone system of course also improves the sound and makes it sound a little more professional now there's one more step in how we can could even make our recordings more professional and we talk about it with you not so much so you will be able to do it yourself but uh, maybe to have some idea of what would be the next step and um, also maybe you will be in a recording yourself and then you will understand why the sound engineers are doing it the way they're doing it. So for the level four, we use more than only two microphones. And this is the multi-microphone approach. And in order to make a little structure in how we put all these microphones, we have different concepts. So the main microphone you already know, it's what Jesper was already uh, just talking about, the ORTF, the two microphones, which are like this, or other ways of putting them. Um, this will be our like, basis. Then um, we will add to them something that's called spot microphones and room microphones. So let's talk about all these different categories. In the main microphone, <clears throat> the same as Jesper said, we already want to collect the sound of the instrument or instruments or ensemble as naturally as possible. This is already the goal that we had all the time. And um, in this main microphone system, it determines the general balance of our, sound, of our recording and also the sound characteristics. And of course, we want to have it at least stereo, so we have one um, channel for each ear. Then we can add <clears throat> spot microphones to that. And the spot microphones are microphones that we will put closer to one instrument or maybe a group of instruments. And they should only collect the sound of these uh, instruments or this instrument. And to achieve that, of course, we need a microphone which records from one side more than the other. So we want to use a cardioid microphone. And using the spot microphones together with a main microphone in a mix, we can actually sharpen the sound and maybe clarify the balance. For example, when we have an orchestra and there's a flute solo and the flute is a little too far or too quiet, we can put a microphone to the flute and then in the mix make it sound louder than it actually was in the concert hall. And lastly, we can add microphones, uh, put them into the room and they will be very far uh, away from the ensemble, usually very deep in the room and they record basically nothing of the direct signal of the ensemble, but only the reverb and the ambience of the room. And of course, for that, we don't want to have any directed microphones, but only microphones to really um, record all the ambience equally. And with this uh, setup, we can now play in the recording. For example, if there's a movement which is a little faster or a little more aggressive, we can use a little more spot, spot microphones uh, we can make it everything a little more clearer and a little more, you know, understandable. But maybe the next movement is a small, a slow adagio movement, and it's everything's like very, you know, uh, atmospheric. Then we can use more of the room microphones and create a little more reverb, and we can in this way balance all these things together. Um, so here again with the piano recording, you can see <clears throat> these concepts. Um, on the back, I have my main microphone in an AB system, what uh, Jesper described, and closer I have cardioids as spot microphones, and uh, in this way I can record already the piano in the room with my main microphones, 
And for example, for the more virtuoso um, pieces that I recorded, I would use a little more of the spot microphones to really make the pianist shine in the recording. You can also see here what I was talking about before with a piano and where we can place the microphones best. You can actually see that the, the, the microphones are you know, in this angle of the lid. Yeah, so they're all on this line a little. Jesper luckily provided us with examples of how these different microphone positions sound. So I will po post a link in the chat now again, and we will take around two minutes and we will have a listen to these examples and then we can come back and talk about it a little. Okay, let's maybe slowly come back. You can rewatch it, of course, anytime. As you heard, there, even on the spot microphones, you could hear a little of the other instruments. And of course, this is inevitable in the uh, classical music recording where everyone is sitting next to each other in the same room. But it's also okay because still we can change the balance a little. Um, with the different instruments. Let's go to two more examples and then um, make a conclusion. So in this ex example, it's another recording I did. This year it's a wind quintet, actually a reed quintet with a saxophone. And here we record it in a room and you can see again these different types of microphones. So if Jasper helps me out again, you have the spot microphones in the front, which are close to the music stands. Then you have this big uh, main microphone on this high stand and much, much in the back, there's a line. You can see this is one of the room microphones and there's a second one, exactly. So this was a very nice room. So I really wanted also to record the room. And as you also see though, there are a lot of carpets on the floor. There are uh, chairs in the back and also the curtains are closed. So still I had to really work a lot on the um, acoustics here in the same principle that actually uh, Jasper said. So uh, using 
carpets and curtains as absorbers to get rid of a little of uh, the reverb because it was a little too much. And also using the chairs actually as diffusers to make the sound of the reverb a little more diffuse and nice. So although you have all these microphones and you have all the possibility, it's still very important to really have the sound in the concert hall uh, or the recording room as good as possible, even if you use this approach. And uh, one last example is a recording I also did this year earlier in the spring. And here's a recording of an orchestra. And um, the main point I want to show you is I have these microphones, which are, um, of course, the main microphones, again, in front of the ensemble. And then I have the spot microphones. Uh, maybe again, Jesper can show them. So I have these ones for the ensemble and these ones for the soloist. Of course, it's always good to have a microphone for the soloist. Um, so they can always be in front of the sample and the sound. But um, I did not put a microphone for each individual player or for example, the first violins or the second violins, but I put one microphone for the whole section because with orchestras, you, you really don't want to hear each individual violin, but you really want to have a nice ensemble sound. So in this way, I can still change the balance. Yeah, so I can make the first violins as a whole a little louder or the second violins as a whole. But um, if I would put a microphone on each instrument, this would actually sound quite horrible. Um, so again, this is also a way you can use spot microphones, not for a single instrument, but actually for a group of instruments. Okay, let's go to the conclusion. This was a lot today, so maybe let's wrap it up again. We were first looking at how we can improve our recordings from the workshop number one, where we were recording ourselves with a cat, with a smartphone and the microphone attached to the smartphone. And the way to achieve that was to separate audio and video. We looked at um, why we want to do that, which settings we have to use on the audio recording, and also in which way we can even better position our microphones to fit the instrument that we are recording. Then we look at the next step, the next level to improve our recordings. And this was the multi, the, 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 the professional microphone uh, approach where we would use more professional microphone and equipment to have um, a better maybe sound and also uh, the system of the main microphone, for example, the ORTF. And then we were looking level four where we could improve our music recordings even more by using the multi-microphone approach, for example, using spot microphones and room microphones. So if you have any more questions, now is really the time to ask them. Uh, yes, I have a question uh, about the final project. Yes. Uh, can I record uh, the audio uh, separately uh, for the final project uh, and then uh, record the video under the already record sound. Yeah, I would say so, if it helps you being created. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any more questions? Okay, if you have any more questions. Ah, there's a question in the chat. Maybe Dima can translate. Yes. Can we find a, a... Okay, maybe the connection dropped. The question was, uh, is it possible to find the video of this, uh, of the lecture today? Yes, we will we will record it and we will put the lecture today online and we will send you a link to to that and this week some sometime. Thank you <laughs> for translating. Okay, more questions. Okay, maybe not. It's already a little late, so Let's try to wrap things up. We also have a new how-to. It's uh, about our second workshop, improving our web conferences. So everything that we talked about, all the settings, 
that we want to set for Zoom are in the written form again there. You should also find it in our resources folder and um, also the translation for that. The next workshop will be about editing audio recordings and the group three will be in uh, next week, uh, November 14th, again at 4 p.m. Kiev time. Every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Kiev time, we have a consulting hour. So if you have any questions regarding this topic or any other topics, please join our uh, Zoom room and ask them. And of course, if you have any other questions and cannot make it on Wednesday, you can always write to us on our support email address. Thank you so much for your attention and hopefully see you next week.